What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of The H Panel the show where I bring on guests from all different backgrounds to talk all the things mental health. I'm your host, Harry Pavan, and today I have a very special guest by the name of Shanice Marcel. Shanice is a professional beach volleyball player who has represented Canada on the international level for the last 14 years. She uses her platform and her online blog to share her story and her experiences with volleyball, injury, and more in hopes to inspire younger, up-and-coming generations of athletes to become the best versions of themselves that they can be. Shanice was such a pleasure to have on, and I hope you guys enjoy this this episode as much as I enjoyed filming it with her. And now for the two pieces of advice that you guys sent in to get this episode started. The first one I have here is, I have it within me today to get me to where I want to be later. Shout out to whoever sent that. I love that quote so much. And the second one I have here is a little shout out to Denzel Washington and one of his motivational speeches, to always fall forward. I love that one so much. Shout out to whoever sent that one as well. Before we get started here, guys, please like, comment, share, subscribe, give five stars, share with a student athlete you know that might need to hear this episode. I think it's very beneficial. Hope you guys enjoy. I'll talk to you soon. Peace. I'm Harry Poppin, and this is The H Panel. Are you in Toronto right now? I am, yeah. Yeah, how, how are you doing with this whole wonderful year? <laughs> what a question. Um, good, I suppose, all things considered. I mean, we didn't get to compete at all for my sport, which was a bit of a bummer, but also not the worst thing in the world. Um, and I won't get to go home for Christmas, which is a little bit sad, but that's okay. All yeah. things considered, I'm doing all right. How about you? I mean, as good as I can. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I, uh, so I worked, I work at the Toronto Zoo. Okay. Cool. And I'm usually a camp counselor. So I teach the kids about all the animals. But because yeah. of COVID, I was, a, I was redeployed to be a custodian. Oh. Uh, which sucked. <laughs> it's a little different. Uh, basically, what I did was I had to station in front of the washrooms and clean it after each person yeah it was like a nightmare <laughs> Madness. yeah so this summer was a little i'm 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 out of it now thank god so <laughs> pandemic's been better yeah <laughs> but, the zoo, that's so fun. what do you usually do there uh, I'm, I'm like teaching kids uh about the different oh. animals yeah Just, oh, that's so fun what a dream job i know right I was so happy when I got it. And then you just learn all these things and you get behind the scenes, like you get to feed them and stuff. Oh, really? That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was oh, a fun job. <laughs> you, uh, you just finished training, right? I just saw that on your post. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday was our last day on sand. And then today was our last day in the gym for a week. But uh, yeah, we've got a nice kind of month long break from from practicing which is really nice I was at the point where I was pretty burnt out mm. but uh yeah things were things are done so I'm happy that's good that's good of oh, going into the new year rested then yeah yeah uh, it was a really long training block for us because uh I started in August training again like once the pandemic hit in what was that March I don't even know anymore every day seems yeah. the same <laughs> Um, but from March till August, I didn't really do anything. I just was doing my best to work out at home and then we were able to start practicing again. So once we started in August, we went right up until yesterday. So it was a long haul. Wow. That's a big stretch. Yeah. It was a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, um, Shanice, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, before we get too into it, I wanted to just, uh, learn a little about yourself, like where you grew up, what made you choose volleyball as a sport, stuff like that. Um, so I was born here in Toronto, but when I was five, my family, we moved to BC because my parents split up. Um, so I grew up in a really small town called Arrington for two years, which is on Vancouver Island. 
probably never heard of it. Nope. <laughs> and then after those two years, we moved to Victoria, which I'm sure you, you've heard of. You um, so that's where I grew up. And then I guess I would have been in grade five when I started playing volleyball. Um, it was pretty much my first sport kind of prior to that. I did a little bit of like cross country, but I really don't like long distance running. So that didn't last very long. <laughs> Um, but yeah, my sister and I were really tall as, as young kids. So we had like a teacher in the school that kind of saw us in the hall one day and was like, you guys try out for the volleyball team. So we did and stuck with it ever since. Um, and now, uh, since three years ago, moved back to Toronto. So everything's come full circle again, I suppose. Um, switched from indoor to beach volleyball and that's what I'm doing now. Nice. Do you, uh, which one do you prefer, beach or indoor? Oh, tough question. Um, I love both for different reasons. Indoor is so fun because it is a team sport. Uh, generally, you'll have like between maybe 12 to 16, maybe even 18 players on a team and, and become like your second family. So that aspect of it was really, really cool and having – you know, just a bunch of girls to travel with and train with and go through the same things with um, and struggle through that together was a really unique experience. And what I love about the beach game is it's just you and your partner. Um, there are no substitutions. You're not allowed to coach on tour. So it is a lot more demanding of you um, as an individual, which I feel plays into kind of how I am as an athlete a little bit better. Um, and probably suits my style of play a little bit better. I'm generally a little undersized for an indoor player in my position. Um, so if I were to pick, I, I would probably pick beach. I knew I would always kind of end up playing beach at one point in my life. It was just um, a matter of timing and a matter of, you know, what worked best for me. Nice. Yeah, I uh, the only experience with volleyball I have is uh... – in in my third no my second year of university uh the swim team we did an intramural game or intramural team and we were called the aqua ballers and we didn't win a single game (laughs) the only game we won was because the other team didn't show up so we we were like yes we're on a hot streak (laughs) um but i i know nothing about volleyball so all the respect to you. I'm I'm more in the pool. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm definitely not. I almost drowned when I was little in a public pool of all places. So I don't enjoy water sports. <laughs> oh God! So it's like a little re- reoccurring thing every time you see water. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had to take like a, a a swimming course in university, and that was like a big struggle for me. But I did it. I can swim, I can do the bare minimum, but uh, it's definitely not fun. (laughs) I will uh, agree with that. Swimming's not fun. (laughs) It hurts. Um, So I wanted to talk about uh, competition comparison. So you you went to university to compete for volleyball and you've been on multiple different stages and levels of competition. So how does the, how does your nervousness and pre-match anxiety differ between the different stages? And then how do you handle this anxiety before a match? That's such an interesting question because when I like transitioned from high school to university, I was such um, like a confident player. And that's what I would say my whole university experience was. I was just someone who like was so eager to play, was so sure of my own skill set and Um, almost wanting to prove to people that like I was good enough even in my my first year I went to a university where first and second years don't typically see the floor they don't typically get any you know start time or play time in general and I was kind of um, one of the first girls in that program to kind of make the coach think oh maybe first and second years can actually play and can handle that stress so um and, and it, it must have worked because we won five championships. And I think that kind of, you know, that confidence and that really, um, that reassurance in myself really guided me through that. And then when I transitioned from being a university athlete to a professional athlete, I went um, and lived in Europe for three years to play professionally indoors. My confidence took a huge hit and that was directly correlated to the coach. Um, 
they were much harder on me as an individual. They demanded a lot more, which of course it becomes your job now. So, you know, a certain standard is required of you. And if you're not hitting that mark within like one, two, three points, you're going to hear about it and you're going to get subbed off or you're not going to see the floor at all. So that was a really big challenge. And like in university, I would never get nervous for games, maybe for like the championship games, just because, you know, there's lots of people watching. Uh, there's a little bit more on the line, but in general, I would never get nervous. And now, like as a 30 year old woman, when I play, I'm so nervous all the time <laughs> before every match. And I think a lot of that came from like having my confidence shut down and having to work to build that back up. Um, but I also like I'm I'm a bit happy to have those nerves as weird as that is to say because I I know that the game then means something to me and that this sport is still um imp important to me and that I still have like a reason for wanting to compete and wanting to try and be better um but how do I manage that uh <laughs> I don't really say, like, I don't really think I have specific things that I do to manage it. It just kind of goes away once I start playing. So I think a little bit of like, you know, deep breathing kind of before those first couple of points or those first actions that you do, um, just to like settle your body physically um, would be the only thing that I do. But after that, I just try and let my, my body and my brain kind of take over and not really like think about things too much and just do what I've done for so long. Yeah, nice. I feel uh, I've found that um, sometimes I'll be like, I'll feel like I'm out of it. And then once I hear the whistle, or like, uh, when I played rugby, once I heard the ball get kicked, like, that's when your brain switches. And that's the beauty of being an athlete is like, you can switch. And you're like, okay, I'm in it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think it's when you get almost too caught up in those nerves, like, oh my gosh, I'm nervous. Oh my gosh, my stomach is turning. Oh my gosh, like my brain's over here, over here. Instead of actually thinking of what I have to do in this moment, that's kind of when it, it, it becomes too much and um, you're not able to control it. But if you just let your, at least in my experience, if you just kind of let your body and your mind relax into what you're doing because you've been doing it for so long, then it's much easier to, you know, overcome that stuff. Yeah, definitely. hundred percent. Um, so the Europeans are intense then? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I played in Germany for two years, so I don't know if you've ever heard anyone speak German, but uh, <laughs> it is, it's a harsh language. Um, especially when people are yelling at you in German or like you've got thousands of fans and everyone's like yelling and screaming cause they're so excited about the game. It's just uh, a little bit much, but yeah, they love their sports over there, which is, is really really cool um i think with volleyball you don't traditionally see that at the later stages of the game like it's quite big for club volleyball um in in canada but kind of beyond that it's not that important it seems which is so bizarre because i think it's such a beautiful sport but yeah the europeans love it and they are um a bit out there let's say <laughs> <laughs> i love that yeah no i what i knew nothing about volleyball and then I started uh going to like the matches at university and it was like this is a lot of fun and like it's mm -hmm. it's intense and people yeah. I don't know why it doesn't get enough hype yeah that's definitely a really good question and and I hope in future years it starts to get you know the the hype and the respect that it deserves because I think volleyball players are phenomenal athletes yeah 100 percent um so you have a couple blog posts on your website uh and i wanted to go over a couple of them uh sure. so the first one uh was kind of uh circling around your injuries um and you you mentioned that you experienced two acl tears if i'm remembering right close uh a shoulder surgery and then, and then my acl tear sorry right um so with these two uh, what kind of mental strain was there when you experienced not one, but two uh, rock bottom, quote unquote, injuries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a really difficult time in my life. And, it, you know, it wasn't too, too long. Ago. Um, in 2016, kind of after my year playing overseas, um, I was in France at the time and I kind of had you know, this overused shoulder injury that I knew I needed some time off. And I would plead with my coach, like, hey, like, I don't think I can, 
actually play this match. Like I just need like two weeks to get my shoulder back into shape, but I never got that. And, and I ended the year and came home and had to get surgery. And that was like one of the hardest things to have to overcome for a couple of reasons. Like the first being that I had never been injured before in my life. Like I, I had barely rolled an ankle. So it was out for like, you know, maybe one game or one practice, but I was the type of athlete that like, even if I was so sick and like, couldn't move, I was still going to show up for practice. So <laughs> I had to take, you know, a month where I was in this sling and couldn't move my arm. Daily things became really challenging to do. I had to rely on a lot of people to help me out in those first couple of weeks. Um, and I was with the national team at the time, but this was the year that um, the indoor national team was moving from Winnipeg to Vancouver. So I had actually no one there to help me through that recovery. And I really had to go through it alone. Um, and then I felt like I had my like midlife athlete crisis of, you know, who am I without volleyball? What am I going to do with my future? Like, am I going to be able to play when I come back from this? Um, so that was really, really stressful to go through. And, and it was certainly really challenging. And I think that was a lot of the, you know, darkest times in my life um, for obviously all those reasons that I just kind of explained. Um, but I knew that I wanted to leave the sport on my, my own terms. So doing the rehab, watching extra video, doing like literally anything that I could to still keep myself within it. Um, I had made the decision to switch over to the beach game. So reaching out to the coaches here in Toronto and trying to set myself up, up that way. Um, it just gave me something to look forward to and it made it a little bit easier to overcome those like last couple of months when the first couple months were really challenging. Um, and then in 2017, I moved here <laughs> And this was maybe a year after my shoulder recovery, like I was feeling pretty good about it. Moved here, started training, <clears throat> not even a month into training, I tore my ACL completely. So then I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do the same thing all over again. And I think a lot of times when you hear ACL, you're like, oh, that's it, career's over. Or at least that's how it was in the past. Um, no one wants to hear that that's the diagnosis, you know, so. Um, that one honestly was a lot easier to over overcome because I knew what I had gone through in the last year prior to that with my shoulder. I knew the things that I had to do. Um, I knew I had to work really hard at rehab. And again, like I had this vision for myself of wanting to leave the sport on my own terms. So that was um, kind of the driving factor to be able to keep a positive mind when it would have been so easy to be like, that's it. I'm hanging up my, up my shoes. I'm done. Uh, this sport is not for me. Clearly, the, the universe is trying to show me a sign and I should probably step away. But I decided I wanted to do it on my own terms. So, um, yeah, it was really, really challenging. I think anyone who's injured can can attest to that. But uh, I think if you have goals um, for things that you want to do with your sport or whether you want to continue or not, it makes it easier to kind of get through that. Yeah, the uh, the injuries really make you take a step back and think. And like, so my my last season of swimming was uh, was ruined by a back injury, like nerve damage and everything. And it, I really had to like take a step back and, like you said, go who, who am I without swimming? And it at first it's like it hurts because you're like, man, I you know you've spent like over a decade or however long you've been in it doing this one thing and then it's just taken away mm -hmm. and it really makes you sit and like reevaluate yourself mm -hmm. yeah I mean it's so challenging when you invest so much of your time and energy to a sport to have it taken away in an instant from one you know small or big injury but exactly to your point I think um continuing to ask yourself you know who am I without my sport and figure that part of your life out that is going to go like leaps and bounds beyond um, anything like I think if I could have done that before my injury I would have been in a, a much better place going through that um, so whenever I you know talk to younger athletes I really try and encourage them to figure out the things that they like um, besides volleyball, whether it's something as small as like 
writing or something as big as this is what I want to do with my future when I'm finished playing. This is my career path, you know, really figuring out those, those small things that make your life happier. That's great because most athletes just have tunnel vision most of the time. They're just focused on, you know, getting a time or getting a win and they don't worry about the long term. And then you get to the long term and you're like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so in, in that blog post, uh, you have this, the, you have the title that says injured, never broken. So I love, I love that. But what do you mean by this for the viewers? And then what should other injured athletes uh, watching this episode here? Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess injured, never broken means that although an injury is incredibly challenging it is not going to break who you are as a human being and a lot of that is you know figuring those those things outside of sport out and doing some deep soul searching if you will to to figure out the things that make you you and um just realizing that you are more than your sport more or less like there is more to you as a human being than just being a volleyball player um and again, for, for anyone who's injured, that's what I would reiterate is figuring out those things that make you who you are and dedicating time and energy and effort into those. Um, I think sport will be there if you always like choose to let it be there for, you know, X amount of time. We can't play until we're 100 years old. <laughs> Um, but it will always be there if you want it to be there while you're in your youth. But it's important to, you know, figure out the other things that are going to bring you joy because sport is going to, at a certain point of time, you know, be the thing that you're going to not focus all your time and energy into. And you've got to have something else to to ground you um, and give you something to look forward to. Yeah, definitely. Um, on the same kind of not injury theme, but uh, title theme. You have another blog post called Fuck Perfect, um, which I also love. So for the viewers, again, <laughs> what do you mean by Fuck Perfect? And then when did you come to this realization that perfection wasn't what you were really striving for? Yeah, um, I guess that would have happened within the last couple of years, to be honest, you know, going through all those injuries and everything. I used to be the type of athlete, especially when I was a lot younger, that, you know, I expected 100% effort. I expected to be the, the athlete with the most amount of points or be the person who was leading the scoreboard or, or whatever it was. I wanted to be the best. And I always equated that with, you know, I have to have not to throw volleyball terms at you, but I have to make the perfect pass here. Um, I need to make the perfect spike so that I can, can get the point. And I would leave games feeling like if I didn't do those things, then I didn't do my job and I didn't contribute to the team the way that I was supposed to. And that was like such a heavy burden to carry to have to, you know, feel like I always had to be this, um, top performer essentially and that was um, that was just too much for me to carry at a point it became almost a negative to a point where I wasn't sure if you know I even actually liked volleyball anymore because I was expecting so much of myself and if my perception or expectation didn't match what the the outcome was then I wasn't happy there was no like middle ground so I think fuck perfect not to swear I <laughs> um <laughs> For me is that, you know, the, the stuff where you learn the most and you grow the most are the times where you're actually performing the worst, it are the times that you're making the most mistakes and everything feels so challenging and hard and you're really having to, you know, fight your, your brain, fight your mind, fight your body to do the things that you want to do. Those are like the moments where, at least in my experience again, I have had the most growth as a person first and foremost and as an athlete when I'm really going through the shit for lack of a better term. <laughs> yeah, 100%. You, you overanalyzing like causes burnout again if you just think about it too much. Yeah, 100%. And I again with my training block this last period, it was a really long um 
training block and I am a bit physically burnt out in that sense, but I didn't have those same, um, I didn't put those same pressures or demands on myself to, you know, be a hundred percent in training. Again, we don't have any competition. So we're just training to train at this point, but the training block was actually a lot of fun because I just allowed myself to, you know, try and learn and do new things and just have fun with it. And the sport is so much more enjoyable that way. I think there is um, a fine balance between performing when you need to perform, but also um, allowing yourself to enjoy what you're actually doing and not treat it as a job, even if it is your job. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Who'd have thought that uh, telling people to have fun with what they find fun would be a tip? <laughs> You'd be fixed, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on the same topic of burnout, um, what does what does personal burnout look like, and how do you recover from this and fall back in love with your sport? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for me, it can be either like the physical burnout, which again is is a little bit what I'm experiencing right now, just because it has been a prolonged training block, or the mental burnout, which I think is actually a little bit more challenging to to overcome because that's when you're like ugh, like I gotta wake up and go to practice again like uh, I don't want to do this lift oh my gosh I I don't enjoy what I'm doing right now that's when um, I think burnout is actually the most dangerous and that's when a lot of people actually choose to leave the sport because they're at this place where they don't love it anymore they don't find any enjoyment of it or in it <clears throat> um, so for me I try to when I do have long training blocks, I try to put my time and effort into other things. So you'll see my lovely little painting here. Oh, very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been getting into, you know, painting a lot in my spare time to just have something to completely shut my mind off of volleyball um, and, and pour my, my heart and soul, if you will, into something else and to give myself that, that uh, mental break that I'm not necessarily getting if I'm having that prolonged training block um I think overcoming burnout does mean that you need like a significant amount of time away from the sport and again that's physical time off and that's time off to not even think about it at all that's time off to go see your friends or family if we're not in covid or (laughs) go go to the movies or journal. Some people enjoy doing that. For me, it's painting and art and creating and and doing those things, um, again, that I enjoy outside of sport. Yeah, finding that's definitely uh, super important. A lot of of my teammates, uh, including myself, we experienced burnout a lot, like a lot of mental burnout because you would go to practice because we like, we would train between like eight to 10 times a week. So you would go, you would go to practice and then you'd go to like the library and hang out with these people and only talk about swimming and then go to swimming and then come back and do the same thing. So your whole life was swimming. Like I, I barely had any friends in university outside of the swim team. So by the fourth year, you're like, fuck, like, <laughs> like I don't want to talk about swimming anymore. Can we not? Um, but yeah, it's super important to find external uh, hobbies pleasures I guess and I mean it's so challenging right because an an athlete you are always almost expected to do as you're told you are you know expected to show up for practice on time you're expected to give 100% effort in every practice you are expected to you know do extra workouts or extra conditioning or whatever it may be and there are there's all these um external if you will kind of pressures and expectations from whether it's your coach or your strength coach or your mental performance coach or whatever it is there's kind of all these extra things that are put on you and and you're almost treated as if you're superhuman and I think it's really hard for athletes to learn how to advocate for themselves and to learn how to speak up and be like hey I am exhausted or you know what, my body's not feeling 100%. I don't really think it makes sense for me to be here this day or this week, because you feel like when you say that, then you know, you're know you not putting in the same effort as player X over there, and they're going to outperform you the next time or whatever it may be. So there's this really um, 
challenging, like, I don't know what you would call it, maybe a, a mental block, if you will, of, of knowing when to um, ask for some time off and ask for the things that you mentally or physically may need and knowing when to push and knowing when, you know, enough is enough. And I think it's really important that, that coaches are also held ac accountable to that same standard, you know, and um, are able to start to pick up on little signs of athletes, maybe potentially getting close to that burnout stage and to give extra time off and to <laughs> treat their athletes as if they are, you know, humans, first and foremost, they're just people like you and I that are trying to do their best. And sometimes their best means they need a day off at home, sitting on the couch, eating popcorn and having ice cream before bed. <laughs> that sounds so nice right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. Like when, when athletes would ask for time off, the rest of the team's like, like, oh, they're so lazy or, uh, you know, they hmm. don't want to try hard. It's like, well, maybe they just need a break. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I interviewed a, uh, she's a hockey player from Illinois. She's 15. Her name's Morgan. And she went to her coach and she was like, listen, I need like time off or I'm struggling with mental health right now. And the coach cut her from the team because he was like, we don't need that burden. That's so sad. You know, I, I think a kudos to her because not a lot of people are going to do that. Not a lot of people have, um, the confidence to be able to speak up to their coach and ask for those things. And I think part of that is being a female in sport and having a male coach. It is um, a weird sort of power balance if you're not able to um, speak up for yourself. So kudos to that girl for doing that. I think that's nothing but admirable. Um, and that's really unfortunate on the coach's part because he's or she or whoever it was is demonstrating that they don't care what their players are saying. And that's really sad. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And it happens, it happens a lot. So like, to your point again, like coaches are, it's not where it starts for athlete mental health improvement, but it's definitely a factor. Mm -hmm. es especially when you get to high performance sports. I think people aren't asking for time off because, you know, they're lazy. People are asking for a break because they need a break. And right. we should probably honor that. <laughs> I mean, when you get to that point, I don't think you're lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You didn't get to that point uh, in popcorn and ice cream. <laughs> um, so another blog post uh, that you talked about, and this is kind of another theme I wanted to get towards uh is about getting recruited during a pandemic um and so, and I kind of wanted to talk about this because there are you know we're in a pandemic all these student athletes are uh wondering this same question so how can high school athletes show off their talents right now to recruiters during this time mm -hmm. yeah I think um this next year probably the next two years even are going to be really important and they're actually really exciting for athletes who are in in high school trying to get recruited because the power is essentially in their hands they are in control kind of guiding um their recruitment process so i think uh first and foremost for athletes whether they're in grade 10 11 or 12 the first thing that they should be doing is is you know finding any video that they have whether that's from some small group training that they were able to do this year before lockdown, or maybe they have full gameplay matches from last year that they're able to use, kind of compiling all that stuff together um, and, and using the raw film. I think that's a little bit more important to show the coaches. Um, and then, you know, compiling a, a list of where they want to go and having the priority be, you know, the academic school that they want to go to. Um, you know, make a little list of let's say your top five choices and then send an email to those coaches and say who you are, your position, how, what, um, what year you graduate in, send those, that, that film off. I think, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? A coach is not going to get back to you. That's okay. Then you move on to the next one and, and you have that list to kind of go through and, and it's okay if you don't hear back from all the coaches. Um, 
if these athletes don't start, you know, taking that control in their own hands, they're going to kind of miss the, the boat a little bit and, and um, working to be really, really good communicators. So sending that first email, sending a follow-up email, if a coach reaches back to them, you know, responding right away, setting up times to um, talk to the coach on the phone or on Zoom, um, asking if you can speak to the, the team, seeing if you can get a connection with the, the girls or the guys on the team that way and get a little bit of more of a feel for what the program is like, really just asking a ton of questions and then providing as much information and as much um, resources as you have access to. Yeah, the the cards are definitely in the player's hand. Um, and it's gonna like, because I know, well, at least when I was in university, I'm sure it's different, but like uh, athletes wouldn't email the coaches would go to meets and competitions and they'd be the athletes would be like, yeah, they're watching me. They'll reach out. So yeah. now it's like a complete 180. You got to, exactly. yeah, you got to exactly. hold yourself accountable. Totally. And it, and I mean, coaches won't be able to watch at our high school athletes this year. They're at least as far as volleyball goes, there is no volleyball happening right now. So coaches won't be able to see any, you know, weekend tournaments or, um, club championships and who knows what's going to happen next year even so I think that a part of the equation is is really um, weird and challenging both as an athlete and as a coach to try and um, navigate that and essentially coaches are having to um, recruit without having seen some of these players in person so I think there needs to be that extra um, communication piece through email through zoom talk as much as you can get to know each other as much as you can because if you do make a decision to you know go to a college or university or go and play in the states you want to actually know a little bit more about where you're going who you're going to play for um who you're going to play with and those little things so i think again just uh, over communicating in a sense yeah 100 percent um and then on the same kind of theme of uh, athletics in a pandemic um, how, how does one who has lost a season this year due to COVID, how do you stay motivated? Like for you, uh, were you, were you training for 2020? Um, yes and no. Um, my partner and I were essentially training to, um, hopefully be alternates for the Olympics. So there was kind of that, you know, extra, um, high performance step that we were kind of aiming for. and then we didn't actually get any of a season because our season would have started in March. So we, we didn't get anything this year. Um, so I'll, <laughs> it was a bit of, of a bummer in that sense. But again, like I'm at a place in my career where I've had two injuries. I'm almost just very grateful to be able to still be playing. I'm, I'm thankful that my body is still able to kind of manage that. So having this year long break wasn't um, the hardest thing in the world for me. It was kind of like um, almost a, a blessing in disguise. I'll say just because, you know, I switched sports and tried to get into a high level competition right away when I maybe wasn't quite, quite at the level that I wanted to be. So now I've got like this extra year of training under me, which was, was awesome. But I think um, for people who have lost a season and are looking to stay motivated, I think it's just doing what you can. So watching some video, whether you're a high school athlete and you're watching university um, volleyball, or maybe you're watching what the professionals do and trying to um, study the game a little bit more, learn a little bit more about your sport and learn a little bit more of um, people who are, who are competing at a high level, if that's something that you want to do. Um, Another thing you do, you can do, especially if you play a ball, ball sport, I'm going to relate everything back to volleyball. Yeah, of course, it's easy. Of course. yeah. Um, but just like passing a ball around at home, like when I had my knee surgery, I was literally laying on a bed for probably a week hooked up to an ice machine when I would have my volleyball and I would lay on my back in my bed and I would just set the ball and try and see, can I set this ball in a straight line? Can I touch the roof? Can I do this with control? Can I set with one hand? Can I do whatever? And um, 
try and be a little bit creative with what I was doing, but still having like a small feel for the sport and the specific skills that I needed to do. Um, but then I think the, the easiest thing to control right now is your fitness. You can work out at home. Yes, it's not working out in a gym, but that's something that's totally easy to control. Um, you can do like Peloton videos or a Nike app, or I'm sure Adidas has an app. You know, there's tons of apps out there and do a 30 minute home workout and try and do that every day and, and see if you can, you know, improve your fitness that way. Um, so that when you start playing your sport again, you are already in a better position than, than when you left it because, you know, you're in good physical shape to kind of handle that load. Yeah, definitely. On, the, on that note, how, um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this question, right? Um, like, like you say, like at home workouts and stuff, like right now you should, like, there are things that you should be doing or like are essential. Um, so how, how can people stay motivated if, let's say, the resources that they have right now are different to the ones that their entire life they've considered essential? Like, it, for example, let me try to clarify what the heck I'm saying. Uh, so, like, for the International Swim League for swimming, uh, it just started up again after, well, not recently, but, like, in the summer, it started up again after the whole lockdown. And swimmers were coming back uh not having touched the water uh super jacked like looking the best they ever have and world records were getting broken like personal bests were everywhere but it's because like they had been working different muscle groups than they had their whole lives and it actually like took their game to the next level so how how can athletes like stay motivated with these workouts when you know, their whole life, it hasn't really been considered essential for them? Mm, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think for me, like, when I had that, that lockdown period before I was able to start training it again, um, I honestly just tried everything. Like I said, I don't like distance running, I would try running outside because I needed something to do. Um, there was a track right beside where I lived. So you know, I would go and run intervals or yeah, try doing different types of sprints. I would go to a hill outside and, and try and do some hill sprints. That was awful. Um, I tried <laughs> like kickboxing YouTube videos that were an hour long. Like I literally tried everything um, just because, you know, it is hard when you're at home and you're doing the same thing and it becomes monotonous. Um, it's much like, you know, when you're getting to that burnout point in your sport it's like oh gosh another home workout I don't want to do that I think the best thing you, that you can do is honestly try different things and try as much as you can and and challenge yourself in that way um, that's probably the easiest thing that you can do and if you're really up for it there is this video of David Goggins I don't know if you've heard of him that guy is nuts he is so fit and his workouts are insane um but there's like this video where he <laughs> was doing i think it was honestly like push-ups jumping jacks and whatever and he did like a thousand of each and i tried to do that video and it was awful but uh, <laughs> it was it was something to do and then you know what i i kind of enjoyed the pain so i was like oh i want to do better tomorrow i'm gonna try it again and i did that for like four days straight and then i was, got to a point where i was like yeah i'm done with this video let's move on let's try something else <laughs> oh man yeah i uh like in the beginning i i for some reason when i was looking for home workouts i'd pick the people that looked the most jacked and I was like, I can probably keep up with them. But I had been out of the pool for months. And I and like, I would go, I'd do it. It'd be a 10 minute workout. And I couldn't move the next day. <laughs> I would just lose motivation again. It was like the worst cycle ever. Yeah. And I think everyone is like different in that sense. You know, some people love working out and some people love doing tons of different things. And I'm that's not for everyone. Like, I can't say that I love working out at home. That was out of more of a, a necessity for me. Um, but I do enjoy trying different things. So that was like the only way that I could could manage those at home workouts. So I think it's just a matter of like knowing yourself and knowing 
what you do and don't like and then trying to kind of nurture that yeah even if you don't know yourself now is the perfect time to figure it out totally totally um so what what should athletes who let's say they weren't gonna um go pro and they're in their last year of university and this was going to be their last season what should these athletes keep in mind right now Mm-hmm. oh yeah my heart goes out to those people but I think you know making the most of it with what you can so I coach at, at York University here and we have two athletes who are in their fifth year who will probably not get you know much of a season if anything hopefully we can have some scrimmages amongst our team but I think those two girls have done a tremendous tremendous job of making the most of what the year has been. They have been so active in, you know, reaching out to the first year athletes and getting to know their teammates on a more deeper level and, and being really superstar rock solid for everyone else when, you know, everything is coming crashing down and we're having to adjust and, we're not allowed to practice now and everyone's moving to home workouts. These girls have done an amazing job of like having a really positive outlook on trying to just do the best with what they can. And I think they've been, um, yeah, kind of pillars for, for what athletes who are losing this season should be. And I think, yeah, the best thing that you can do, whether you do get a chance to, play or not you do get a season or not whatever it looks like is to just enjoy and savor every moment for what it is and really really appreciate it because I think being a university athlete or being a high school athlete and your your career is ending whatever it is those are such special times in your life that are going to um, propel you for your future they're going to set you up for Um, so many things in your life and I think those experiences and those bonds with your teammates are really really special so just making the most of it as you can yeah as as tough as that is like it's all you can do right now really really yeah so I only have two questions left for you and they're not really related to sports at all it's just kind of the two that I'm asking this season for all my guests So the first one here, um, so with this pandemic, there's been, and this is no surprise to anyone, there's been multiple reports that mental illness cases uh, have increased, substance abuse has increased, domestic abuse has increased, and a large portion of these numbers increasing can be linked tightly to uh, the huge amount of job loss in the world, the fear mongering that the media loves to give us. Uh, personal loss, and then th- this un- growing s- uncertainty that a lot of people have because you know we're going into a second lockdown. Toronto is already in the second lockdown, so mm-hmm. like yes, the vaccine's there, but like what's going on, kind of thing. So where do we go from here, and how can we stop these numbers from rising? That is such a. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I'll just start off and say that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's really tough. I can really appreciate this situation from both sides. Um, But I think if we're going to overcome this in a way that's positive for everyone, we need everyone to do a really good job of, you know, doing the bare minimum, staying at home as much as you can, wearing a mask, um, doing kind of those little things that the government and and, um, the health ministers or whatever are telling us to do. I think those are, are so important, especially around this time. But I can appreciate how challenging that is, especially, you know, if you live alone, if you don't live in a good situation, whatever it may be. Um, And I would say for people who are in those circumstances, do your best to find resources to help you through that. Um, When the first lockdown hit, I was in a not very good place. Uh, There was a lot of things that happened in my life that really... um, caused some challenges. So I took it upon myself to reach out to um, Morneau Chappelle, my French is not good, Um, (laughs) but, (laughs) and and speak to a therapist because I knew that that was what I needed in that moment to um, help me deal with everything that was going on. Cause it felt like, you know, volleyball is not here. My family is on the other side of the country. 
this is going wrong, this is going wrong, nothing's going right. And it just became a little bit too much at one point. So I think it's really important for people, you know, if they are struggling to find those resources to help them, and if they're not sure where to find those resources, to ask someone that they're close to to hopefully help them. Um, or reach out to a family member that they're close to to be like, hey, like I'm not, I'm not okay, and to know that that is also okay to say those things, to verbalize them to someone else, and to rely on someone else for help. Um, but yeah, I can really appreciate how um, challenging this time is, this situation is. It's not one that I don't think anyone pictured ourselves being in at any point in our lives so it's really weird to kind of go through and I see it see it from both sides but I think that the, the sooner we can kind of nip this thing in the bud and and then the sooner the vaccine rolls out and all that stuff then you know we're going to be in a much better place one year from now yeah I 100% uh the nice thing about like the internet now is that all these resources are pretty easily accessible for most people I should say but like it's just like one click away, one call away. So that definitely helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then my last question for you, actually, for first on the topic of masks again, um, I I personally like the mask in the winter. I don't know. My face gets so cold. <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> I, I transit everywhere so I'm like always out in the cold I'm like oh this is like an extra warming accessory <laughs> exactly it's it's not a scarf but it like does the same thing I've uh yeah. I've seen yeah. I saw I mean yeah. oh go ahead no, no no go for it go for it I was just gonna say I, I see how it is an inconvenience to have to be like I, I left my house but I forgot my mask I have to go back and get it like it is a bit of a pain in the butt but uh to your point, I, I like wearing it too. <laughs> I, uh, I've seen people, this, this is something that I will never understand, but they'll be in like a grocery store and they'll, they'll have their mask on, but they'll take it off to cough. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> that, uh, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> Does that not defeat the entire purpose? I think so. I, think I saw it at the zoo all the time and I was so confused. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? That's the one thing you should have a mask on for. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, oh. I just had to get that out because I never understood that. It's too funny. <laughs> um, so my last question for you, Shanice, is um, I've been getting a lot of people reaching out to me, uh, being stressed and anxious because uh they feel like they haven't done anything quote unquote significant during this entire pandemic. Uh, and a lot of this can be attributed to when, when it first started, there were a lot of Instagram uh, accounts. I don't even know what other word to say, Instagram accounts and people going, what are you going to do about it? Uh, this is your time to shine. This is your time to get fit, do all these things. Cause you have so much free time uh, without really considering the traumatic uh, impact that COVID had on everyone. So what would you say to people who may be feeling this anxiety or this stress because they haven't done anything significant during these last eight, nine months? Yeah, honestly, screw that and screw all those accounts, like, or even like being on Instagram or being on TikTok or whatever it is. And you're seeing people doing all these cool things like that is okay. If that's not your reality for the first, like, I don't know, six or seven months of, of COVID, I really didn't do very much. And I, to kind of what you're saying, I was like, well, I'm 30 years old. Like I'm not accomplishing anything significant. I haven't solved world hunger or whatever it is. You know, like I hadn't done anything big and, and that was okay because I needed that time to, you know, to your point, like get through my own trauma and get through my own things that I was dealing with. And that was completely 100% okay and and if I made like a silly little dance video one day pat on the back to me Shanice like you did something fun and you tried to make someone else you know bring them joy by doing that or if I sat around and did nothing for the whole day you know that is okay too especially if you are dealing with so many things it's hard to find the energy and find the motivation to 
do something significant every day to, you know, do that two hour workout on this day and then eat healthy the next day. Like, you know what, screw that. Like if your life doesn't look like that, that's totally fine. But I think um, it, it is really important to set some goals for yourself. Um, and I think for me, that's one thing that's helped me be a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to accomplish a little bit more within my days when I give myself like a, a mini to-do list or a goal that I want to accomplish for the week. Um, then I feel like, hey, like I checked all the bark boxes off of my to-do list today. Like, that's awesome. That is a win for me. It didn't have to be anything big other than like make dinner for myself. And that's okay. Um, I think people really, some of those counts, accounts can blow things out of pro proportion and make you feel really bad if your life does not meet that picture. Um, but I think people need to know that it's okay if, you know, whatever you're doing with your time and your life doesn't match this Instagram influencer. It doesn't match what your best friend is doing. It doesn't match whatever. Your life is what it is and whatever you can accomplish in a day, sometimes that's good enough, whether it's a lot of things or a small amount of things. Um, but for me personally, I, I do need that kind of goal setting or to-do list or, you know, something really, really small that I want to do for my day so that I can feel like, hey, like I made it through the day and I actually did something and I can feel okay about that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So you don't have to make a million dollars right now. It's okay. No, probably <laughs> won't make a million dollars ever, and that's okay. <laughs> Never going to see those digits. Um, so where, where can my viewers find you? Oh, good question. Do I even know my handles? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Shanice Marcel 18. Um, I have my own website. I post some blogs on there. That's www.shanicemarcel.com. Um, yeah, those are probably the, the two main places I would send people to. Right on. Uh, Shanice, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, no problem, Harry. Nice to meet you and nice to chat. It's been fun. And to all my viewers, I will see you guys next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching another episode of my show. If you want more episodes of the H panel, the button's gonna be right here. If you wanna subscribe for more videos from myself, it'll be right down below. Please like, comment, share, give five stars. Let's keep this conversation going, guys, all right? I'll see you next time. Thank you for your support.